Lecture 26 continues the story of South Eastern Asian civilization, starting with the collapse of the Harappan civilization, which took place around 1700 BC, the period when the great cities of the Indus ceased to exist and the Harappan population dispersed into smaller communities. First, I'm going to describe the Vedic period, a time when a wave of cultural change and perhaps major population movements, the evidence is uncertain, swept South Asia from the northwest. Then we'll evaluate very briefly the controversies over the origin of the Indo-Aryan or Sanskritic languages. Then I'm going to describe how iron technology and rice agriculture caused the center of civilization to move eastward to the Ganges plain, hot and humid, as foreign conquerors descended on India. And we'll show how conflicting religious doctrines of Brahmanism and Buddhism were part of the crucible which formed Mauryan civilization, which flourished in the Ganges Valley and further afield between the 4th and 2nd centuries BC, or coming into the conspectus of the last 2,000 years. And then we'll show how Buddhism encouraged foreign trade with the Southeast Asia and with a much wider world. And then finally, I'm going to describe a catalytic event in the more recent history of this area, the discovery of the monsoon wind cycle in the first century BC, which enabled people to sail from Africa and Saudi Arabia to India and back in the course of 12 months, a phenomenon which created a vast world of interconnectedness across the Indian Ocean and beyond. During the centuries after the collapse of Harappan civilization, a long process of population movements, assimilation of outsiders with local culture, and acculturation continued in South Asia for a thousand years. These centuries are sometimes called the Vedic period, a time when Indo-Aryan-speaking peoples spread into what is now India and Pakistan. This event, if it occurred, is described in the Samhita, a compilation of the hymns or Vedas of the Rig Veda. Now many of these hymns were composed earlier and then passed from generation to generation by word of mouth over many centuries. They tell of heroes and conquests, of battles and military campaigns of figures that were larger than life. To what extent does the Samahita reflect historical reality? Well, that's much debated. One school of thought believes that there were many migrations into South Asia, where the migrants married with local groups, the intermarriage giving place to the Indo-Aryan Sanskritic languages spoken widely through South Asia today. Another school of thought believes to the contrary, that there was no invention, that the Indo-Aryan languages developed indigenously in South Asia and were present many centuries earlier. I must confess, being a non-linguist and an archaeologist, I tend to believe that probably a great deal of this developed indigenously within the confines of South Asia. But whatever historical reality, the period between 1700 and 800 BC was a time of major cultural change and technological innovation. By 800 BC, an indigenous iron technology flourished throughout South Asia. As you know, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Iron was first developed as a new technology in the second millennium BC. Here, it appears to have developed somewhat later. But it had one very, very major consequence. It accelerated the growing and production of rice. Because 
It enabled people to move soils, to fell trees with much greater ease than had been in the case in earlier times. And as we said in the last lecture, rice cultivation really took hold and expanded in the hot and humid Ganges River Valley of the East. So effective was the new agriculture, so productive, that within two centuries, only 200 years, 16 major kingdoms were centered on cities in the Ganges Plain. This cannot have been a particularly calm period of Indian history. There was fast economic growth. And there was also, presumably, a great deal of intercity conflict. And we know there was certainly major religious controversy. On one side of the controversy was Brahmanism a form of Hinduism which placed great emphasis on ritual and sacrifice. This, at first, was the dominant religion. But then philosophers of the 6th century BC, like Buddha and Makali Gosada, challenged Brahmanism with revolutionary doctrines which militated against sacrifice. Buddhism, with its teachings of personal sacrifice, personal spiritual development, spread rapidly, becoming the dominant religion in the North within five centuries. But at the same time, India had become a happy hunting ground for foreign conquerors who were eyeing the fabled riches of South Asia. For example, in 516 BC, King Darius of Persia invaded the northwest and incorporated the Indus Valley briefly into his vast Persian Empire. Two centuries later, Alexander the Great brought Greek culture as far as the Indus. But his death at an early age brought a major political vacuum in its train. The great ruler in the Ganges, Chandragupta Maurya of Magadha, took advantage of the political turmoil and carved out a huge empire, the Mauryan Empire, in the third century BC. At its height, under the rulership of Chandragupta's grandson, Asoka, the Mauryan Empire extended over a staggeringly large tract of country. From Nepal in the north and deep into India's Deccan in the south. Now between 269 and 232 BC, Asoka sought to diversify and unify his, his kingdom at the same time, accommodating the diversity while unifying the kingdom with a well-defined moral and ethical code based on Buddhist principles. Now, he built this empire, this Mauryan empire, not only on Buddhist philosophies, but also on a teaching which was to have a major, major impact on the future course of history in Southeast Asia. The notion that the prosperity of Buddhism was closely connected to the dealings of prosperous merchants. In other words, it was quite okay to look outside the confines of your own land, your own home city, and to trade with others, even people of other religions, at a distance. As a result of this wise policy, Magadha and other northern Mauryan cities prospered greatly from trade with northwestern lands, with Afghanistan, Iran, and beyond. At the other end of the empire, the port of Tamluk, at the mouth of the Ganges River, was a window to a new and expanding world across the Bay of Bengal to southeast 
Asia. Now, the older religion, Brahmanism, had placed severe restrictions on foreign voyages, partly on what can only be described as racist grounds, the notion that other peoples with other faiths were inferior. In contrast, Asoka and his priests encouraged expanded trading activity and particularly travel along maritime trade routes, along well-known open water passage courses which extended not only into Southeast Asia but also far to the West. So you got developing the beginnings of long, long distance connections between people who never met face to face. The Mauryan Empire declined in 185 BC, but the trade continued and expanded. And like so many things in history and prehistory, it was an event on the other side of the world which really made a difference to this trade. In the year AD 70, the Roman Emperor Vespasian prohibited the export of metals from the Roman Empire to combat inflation. This development turned India's merchants' eyes in a new direction to the southeast, where they knew there was great potential. But, <coughs> but at the same time, they tried to work out ways of circumventing established and well-pleased Roman trade winds, uh, trade routes. In this, they were helped by the seasonal cycles of the monsoon winds of the Bay of Bengal and the Indian Ocean. They were successful. In the reign of the Emperor Nero, who reigned just before Vespasian came to power, the annual trade deficit between Rome and India was a staggering 60 million denarii a year, a huge sum of money. It was Rome's taste for luxuries which fueled the trade which had roots in much more ancient commerce. The incense trade in frankincense and myrrh, for example, there was an absolutely insatiable demand in Egypt for these spices, these perfumes, which had long linked the Nile and the Red Sea with the incense states of southern Arabia. Now, ever since Sumerian times, merchant ships had coasted along age-old inshore routes, sailing from Arabia into the Persian Gulf and on to the distant Indian coast. Now, the way you should think of these maritime tracks, which of course go right back to the Rapids, is as you would think of a desert path. They passed from bay to bay, from headland to headland. Every skipper knew where shelter could be taken in time of storm, where the best offshore winds were to be found, and at what seasons of the year the passages could be made. They sailed in vessels with lateen rigs, long wooden yards set on a short mast which gave you a long leading edge for the sail which enabled these boats unlike fore and aft ships to sail against the northeast monsoon winds which did not blow particularly strongly but using them they could sail along the coast for mile after mile along the Arabian coast from the mouth of the Red Sea and from there they could either turn into the Persian Gulf and make their way up to Basra, or they could turn the corner to India, sail southeastward. Now, this sort of knowledge 
like the navigational skills of the Pacific Islanders, is something that is not written down. It's something that is passed from father to son, from skipper to mate, from crew to crew, as very jealously guarded professional secrets. There was a brotherhood of the seamen, unspoken. One where they knew every corner of the coast, where pirates might be found, where brigands would lurk, where the best profits would be made. And they knew where the navigation was trickiest, where timing of currents was important, and above all, they knew the annual rhythm of the winds. And sometime in the first millennium BC, Indian skippers mastered the secrets of the Indian Ocean's monsoon winds. This rhythm, which unfolded like clockwork year after year, year in, year out, opened a brand new world. During the summer months, from June to September, the monsoons blow across the Indian Ocean from the southwest. This means that you can sail in front of the wind from Africa to India or from Arabia directly to India without coasting along the shore or going into the Persian Gulf. And then wonderful winds that they are. In November, they reverse and they blow from the northeast, the opposite direction. So you can sail back. Thus, you had a cycle which enabled you to pass from Arabia or the Red Sea to India and back, or from the East African coast to India and back in the course of 12 months. From India too, the monsoon cycles also operated. You could ride the monsoon, the southwest monsoon, across the Bay of Bengal, direct to Southeast Asia. Now, Southeast Asia was another crucible. I use the word crucible a lot in this class. It's a very good word because it implies a sort of frothing of ideas and innovation and trade. And it was in Southeast Asia that Indian merchants came in touch with Chinese traders and an entirely different commercial world, which we'll visit in later lectures. Now there's something about this, as a seaman, psychologically rather profound. Until the discovery of the monsoon cycles, almost all voyaging in the Indian Ocean was done along the coasts, and the same undoubtedly applied in the Bay of Bengal. But now, for the first time, Ships ventured offshore, out of sight of land. Now they knew the coasts intimately. They knew that at the other side of the Indian Ocean there was a shore, a familiar shore. But at some point, either Arabian or Indian skippers jumped over a fairly large psychological boundary. Instead of coasting round to India or back, they simply sailed offshore, straight across. Not a particularly hazardous voyage, except when the winds blow strong, although it can be boisterous. But something where you're out of touch with the world, with the familiar reality of the shore. And once they'd done it, there was no going back. It's just like cruising in a small boat today. The toughest open water voyage you make is the first one. Because psychologically, once you've got comfortable being out of sight of land, and you know you will reach the other side safely, you're fine. And that's what happened. Now at first, the Arabians and the Indians kept their navigational secret to themselves. And then, by chance, an Indian ship was wrecked in the Red Sea. Its skipper was rescued and brought to Alexandria in Egypt. And he talked about the Indian Ocean, or the Erythraean Sea, 
the Red Sea, as the Indians and the Arabians called it. And somewhere about 115 BC, just as the Mauryan Empire was stretching its legs, and just as it went into decline, but the trade was continuing, the first Greek skippers, the first Egyptian skippers, not just local Arabians and Indians, used the monsoon winds to cross to India. Instead of coasting, they ventured straight offshore and sailed direct to India without the benefit of coastal landmarks on the winds of wings of the southwestern monsoon. The monsoon winds became popular knowledge in the writings of a man called Cosmos Indicoplustes, Cosmos who sailed to India. And in the early first millennium AD, the first pilot guide of the Erythrean Sea appeared. It was called, it has the rather charming title of the Periplus of the Ocean Sea. A Periplus, a going around. It is based clearly on a memnonic description of the ports and islands and commodities traded on the shores of the Indian Ocean. It stretches at one part from East Africa right round to India. And you learn that this just wasn't an isolated world of isolated towns. The Erythraean Sea was becoming the center of a huge mercantile world that sailed around the edges of the Roman Empire. In the east, the trade routes extended as far as Southeast Asia and indirectly to China. The monsoon winds, as we shall see, linked the elephant ivory rich East African coast with India the Red Sea with South Asia and helped forge a web of interconnectedness in new and lasting economic relationships. What you're seeing here is a new world. It's a world where people widely separated were aware of each other in ways they never had been before, where luxury commodities crossed for thousands of miles away from the place where they were made. One example, silk. Silk appears in Egypt at least 2,000 years earlier ago, even earlier. We don't exactly know when. It came probably over land. But there were other commodities too. The other thing that flowed were ideas. And increasingly in the first millennium AD, we begin to see the Mediterranean world becoming more and more linked with that of Asia. Because now we're really beginning to operate in a time of global economies. The vehicle for the monsoon winds was a vessel called the Tao. It was latine rigged. Its design goes back deep into the remote past. Few Dows sail today. There are some that do on the East African coast. They come into places like Mombasa and Lamu and Zanzibar and still sail the age-old routes. But the verity behind them is a verity that has operated since the very beginnings of history. And that is that no one community has all the commodities it needs to feed its people, to survive, and to honor its rulers. For instance, back in the 1930s, a famous author who chronicled the dying age of sail, Alan Villiers, spent some time sailing on Indian Ocean dhows. He accompanied them as they went to the, mang the mangrove swamps of East Africa, loaded wooden poles, and then passed from port to port up the coast of Somalia and across into Saudi Arabia, where the timber was sold 
at a high markup simply because there was no timber for buildings in Saudi Arabia. The trade continued right into very recent times. This was a trade, the Indian Ocean trade, that carried people, ideas, luxuries, and basic commodities. It was a trade that fostered the prosperity of people living thousands of miles away from those to whom they sent gifts, to whom they sent commodities. It was a trade, in a way, based on trust, because over these long, long distances, there were established values for, say, Indian Ocean seashells, or for glass beads, or Indian cotton, or African ivory. And this trust helped the development of history and of human societies in places where one society had never even seen the other. It was just the merchants who kept this going. And there's a very important point to make about this trade, and also about the camel trade, the trade done by the camel, and the importance of the domestication of the camel, which occurred in the first millennium BC, isn't the camel itself. It is the saddle on the back of the camel. And directly people developed saddles from which they could fight, or saddles upon which they could carry loads. They could cross the deserts. Camels were known as the ships of the deserts. And you got this opening up of trade routes across the Sahara, of the Silk Road, of Central Asia, and so on, where you got, again, a sort of monsoon wind cycle effect, this time with the camel saddle, where more interconnections occurred. But, as we said earlier, if you are building or develop such trading connections, the monsoon Indian routes, or the routes of the Silk Road, or the Saharan routes, something happens. These are caravan routes by sea or by land. They are people by, by folk who spend their entire lives on the move. They truly are international citizens. They are not parts of a particular country, even if they are by birth, say, a Saudi Arabian or an Indian. These were people who were the vehicles of interconnection. They were people who looked neither to the left or the right, who owed political loyalty to nobody who resided over an extremely cosmopolitan society, which was the society of the caravan and the Tao and the merchant vessel. And without this form of connection, manned by people who had no particular li liabilities, no particular political liabilities, you couldn't have had the continuity of trade, which continued despite changing political conditions, despite the collapse of one market but being replaced by another, because the caravans always kept going under the unspoken umbrella, under the notion the trade and interconnectedness was more important than any form of short-term political gain. Of course, there were breaks and there were ups and downs, but the truth of this interconnectedness is that it was permanent, and it was manned by people who spent their entire lives on camel's backs or in ships, fostering and linking the webs of interconnectedness. Thus it was that the Indian Ocean routes brought South and Southeast Asia as well in uh, China, and the land routes of the North in contact with Western world. The unchanging cycles of the monsoon winds were the southern equivalent of the ancient Silk Road across Central Asia. And the camel, with its saddle, was another link that kept these cycles going, kept these connections going. In this lecture, we've described the wave of cultural changes and population moves, movements that swept over South Asia after 1700 BC. We've described the controversies over the origins of Indo-Aryan languages, which are still unresolved. We briefly mentioned the foreign invaders who reached India, and the rise and fall of the Mauryan civilization, whose Buddhist beliefs fostered overseas trade and maritime voyaging to Southeast Asia and into the Indian Ocean. 
And then finally, we describe the discovery of the monsoon winds, which revolutionized the inside Indian Ocean world and interconnectedness. And as we will see, this web of interconnectedness helped create new civilizations elsewhere in Asia.